little prophetic book of Jonah is a wonderful tale. A lot of fun to read, especially in Hebrew. I'd like to poke around with you the very conclusion of the book in chapter 4. And look in particular at one problematic verse that I always wrestled with until I learned some Hebrew when it was able to figure out what was actually going on. Jonah is kind of a unprofit. He is exactly the opposite of what you want a prophet to be. When he's called to go and preach repentance to Nineveh, he gets on a boat and tries to go in the exact opposite direction from the Assyrian city all the way to Spain. When he does preach his message that Nineveh is going to be overthrown and the people actually respond instead of being happy that his prophecy was so effective, he is really angry that he's prophesied destruction and it doesn't come on these Assyrians who he prophetically knows will turn out to be a horrific, murderous enemy of Israel in the not-too-distant generations. So he goes out and sulks and sits on a hill overlooking Nineveh, waiting for the judgment to come, which he's been informed is just not going to happen. And God allows this gourd plant to cover him and give him shade, but a worm eats the gourd plant, and a very powerful, demonic, scorching wind, like the Pazuzu heat demon of the ancient Near East, torments him, and he's just full of agitation and anger, and God says, okay, well, you've got issues with the gourd, shouldn't I have issues with Assyria? They're actually the object of my planting and nurturing and care, which in and of itself is a marvelous thing for God to say. God doesn't care just about one people, but nurtures and grows and tends even a people that Israel will experience as an enemy. But I want you to look a little bit more closely at this text because most translations talk about Jonah's sympathy, concern, or pity about the gourd. And I just don't see those emotions inside Jonah at this point. So we need to kind of poke around and see what's going on. So this last part of Jonah is a pretty important part of the book. It's here that Jonah gets reproved and supposedly is taught a lesson. And yet, I've heard quite a few sermons in Episcopal churches where I'm left kind of confused about exactly how God explains what's going on to Jonah. And I think you can see it even here in this NRSV translation. So, there is a tremendous, sultry east wind. So that's this hot wind without moisture that dries and parches and torments that comes in off of the desert, out of the east, not off of the Mediterranean coming from the west. It beats down on Jonah's head. He becomes faint. He wants to die. He becomes sarcastic. I'd rather die than live. This wind is so bad. The worm has attacked the bush or the gourd that was giving him shelter. And he's not really so sympathetic about this bush, which doesn't have a personality per se. He's mostly just pretty angry and pissed about having to face this dry Sirocco east wind with no covering for, for his head underneath the shade of the gourd. But then the gourd is used as an object lesson. God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? 
Jonah says, yes, angry enough to die. And then the Lord said, well, you were concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. Shouldn't I be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, with all of those people who are confused and disoriented, never mind the animals as well. It's nice that God cares about the animals. So it's great that uh, Jonah is being taught about concern. But was he really concerned about the bush? I think that's the problem. And there must be a better way of translating this. The Hebrew term here is chus, chus. So let's go over and find it in verse 10. Here we have it here in the second person form. You were concerned, chasta. Again, we have chus. But I don't think Jonah really empathized with the bush. I don't think that's the point. So what we're going to do is we're going to look this up and got a number of choices here, but we'll pick the New International Dictionary of Old Testament. And if we go down now and look at all the different possibilities for translating chus. It originally is used in connection with the eye. When one is in turmoil, the eye often reddens or cries. I think the idea of sympathy or empathy or pity is a later development. So here's our discussion under entry number five, under chus. In Genesis 45.20, the chusing is about material things, namely the goods and baggage that Jacob and family ought to leave behind when they make the journey to Egypt. And it's not so much that they care about or empathize or feel sorry for the, for the stuff. It's just that they're, they're concerned and anxious about it. And the, uh, the response of Joseph is, give no thought to your possessions for the best of all the land is yours. So it's not really a, an issue of being untrue or unfaithful and not being sympathetic enough with all of those material things. But it's really don't get all fraught and upset and in turmoil over them. Don't regret leaving them behind. So I think that is what's going on here with John. It would be better to translate it. You are all worked up, fretful, um, regretful that the bush died. Not you were concerned about the bush's feelings. So look where with regret is clearly the meaning here. And this also fits the context better in Jonah 4.10. For clearly Jonah does not have pity on the plant. Instead, he regrets its loss. Um, very few English translations capture that well. You really need to plow into the Hebrew to get a good sense of it. We can check a few. We had looked at the NRSV. Let's look at the NIV real quick. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you didn't tend it or make it grow. Still not quite right. Take a look at the message. Translation by Peterson. This is a little better. How is it that you can change your feelings from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shade tree that you did nothing to get? I actually kind of like that better than the NRSV. So that's interesting. Here we have a case where the message, a paraphrase that's often looked at with contempt and scorn, actually seems to be closer to the Hebrew. Interesting. Okay, um, just a little 
Hebrew exegesis that uh, might actually be important to point out in a sermon. Thanks for listening.